Hey everyone, this is Zephyr with an advanced tutorial for automated evocations. If you haven't seen the previous tutorial on automated evocations or aren't familiar with the module, make sure you go check that out first. In this tutorial, we're going to go over how to make custom scaling creatures similar to the arcane hand we showed off in the previous video. But this time, they'll scale how we want and can be used in any system. We'll also go over how to create custom animations like a poison cloud. That way, we can really customize our look using other animated assets that we already have or some of the assets already included in the macro. Additionally, we'll go over creating spells that allow us to summon multiple different creatures, such as ice, fire, plague, and darkness variants of an elder demon here. Finally, we're also going to take a look at some of the other applications of using macros, such as bringing in a T-Rex and having it roar when it gets summoned. First, let's break down what the AE companion macros can do. They all need to be named in the same way, and the actor name is going to be what we change to the name of the creature being summoned. These macros pass information, like summon, which is the actor that's being summoned, the spell level that checks the level of the spell triggering the summoning, duplicates in case we're summoning more than one, and the assigned actor, which is the actor that is actually doing the summoning. For players, this is their player character. For GMs, it's the last selected token. Now let's take a look at an example with the arcane hand macro that we looked at last time. The return area is where we can reference those different arguments we talked about earlier. So you can see in this top portion where we're updating the health, we're referencing the assigned actor, so the character doing the summoning, and getting their max HP to be able to set the current and max HP of the summoned arcane hand. We also have an or operator in the form of those two vertical lines, so that if it doesn't have information from the assigned actor, it'll pick one. Going down to the clenched fist and grasping hand items, we can see that the spell level is being used to calculate the damage, and we're also sussing out the melee spell attack to hit of the caster as well. These principles are the same things that we can use for making our own creatures, so let's get into doing that, but first we have to actually make the spell. We're going to start off by making kind of a riff on an example that Ripper made, and we're going to call it Summon Elder Demon. Ripper has an example on the GitHub for automated evocations, that's for Summon Greater Demon, which is a spell in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, but it doesn't have scaling, so I've decided to do this kind of homage. In this one, we're going to do a lot of custom scaling, and here I'm just setting up a spell that will work for it. The details don't really matter, they are mostly just fluff, and I certainly wouldn't consider this a balanced spell, I'm just kind of taking an improvisational stab at it. And that's an important note that you don't necessarily need a specific spell here, and you can use some of these features to bring in useful utility actors as opposed to specifically bringing in an actor that you need for a spell or that is specified in a spell. Don't worry too much about setting up the spell super detailed. Make sure that the summoning works properly and that'll handle the bulk of the work. Now that we made the spell, I'm gonna go ahead and make an actor that we're gonna summon. And I brought in some of these images from Forgotten Adventures and I'm going to make an elder demon that's kind of a fox demon. And I will just configure that token and a little bit of the sheet here. This initial stage is mostly getting things set up for testing and making sure that we have the spell working properly and we'll actually call the Elder Demon for summoning when we cast the spell. We are gonna use this as a template later on. So I'm going ahead and doing a few different bookkeeping things such as setting up vision like I like it. We have that. I've gone ahead and tweaked some things on the sheet and I'm gonna bring up this add cannon shot macro from the previous video. I'm gonna use that as my template for creating the add summon elder demon spell. 
One thing you'll notice is I've added the actual addition of cannon shot inside of a function that I can now make it wait. And then I ask the game to actually refresh immediately all as part of the macro. If you're doing things in bulk, you might not want to do the automated reload, but I really like it for making things simple and then I don't have to worry about, oh, did I refresh? It'll actually be done for me already. This updated version of the macro and all of the macros in this video will be available in the macros channel on the beta week discord. As per usual, I'm making sure that the data tag shares the same name as the spell and the creature matches the same name as the actor I'm summoning. Save that. I'm executing the macro and it's automatically refreshing, like I said. And if I go into my console and use that view game settings macro we had earlier, we'll notice that the summon elder demon is now listed in our custom auto spell section. If I bring in my testing actor and add the spell to their inventory, I'll then be able to summon the demon from their inventory. If you're a GM, it doesn't actually matter if you have the spell slots available. You can still cast the spell and bring up the companion manager. It's also important to keep this in mind when you're doing the custom scaling. That way, if a spell slot isn't used, you still have a default. So let's break down what this demon has on it. I have 100 HP plus 25 per spell level. Then it has an armor class of 13. We're gonna go ahead and add the spell level to that. That's a common template used in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. On multi-attack, it's going to do a number of attacks equal to half the spell's level, rounded down. And while that won't matter in this case, because eight divided by two is four, and nine divided by two, rounded down, is also four, it's a good demonstration. We also have a claw attack that will be shared amongst multiple different demons. And this claw attack is going to use our spell attack modifier and it's going to do 1d8 plus 4 plus twice the spell's level in slashing damage. There's a fire whip that is going to force a dexterity saving throw against the caster's spell save DC. And there is the classic demon ability of death throws, where it will explode and it's going to take an extra d8 of damage per level of the spell used to summon the other demon. So we're going to add all of these features to a custom companion macro, and this will be a really good template for creating other custom companions, such as the Summon Fae or Summon Undead that are included in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, or in your own custom spells. To accomplish this, we're going to create a new AE companion macro. I've brought up the companion macro for Arcane Hand to use as a template, and we're going to match that same syntax. Again, it's really important that the name of it matches that same formula of AE underscore companion underscore macro. And we set it to script to make sure that it runs as a script. And I'll go ahead and copy and paste the macro for the arcane hand to use as a template. This is a great way to learn and see what's doing what within the different macros. That way you can replicate and take things apart piecemeal. The first thing we will notice is that we're calling all kinds of different things, like the spell level and the assigned actor's attributes. We're gonna use that here moving forward, and I'm gonna just go ahead and copy and paste the spell level up here over instead of the assigned actor's max HP, because the HP of our demon is going to be a base plus something dependent upon the spell level. I'm gonna add a lot of parentheses here to make sure I have all my calculations. And I'm making sure to add an OR operator so that if we don't have a spell level, we default to 8, which is kind of our assumed minimum spell level. And I'll subtract 8 from it to make sure that 8 minus 8 is 0, so there's no extra health, but 9 minus 8 is 1, so we'll get multiplied by 25, 25 extra HP per level, and then add 100, which is our base. It's important to repeat this process then for the HP value. Otherwise, if we upcast it as a level 9, its max HP will be 125, but the regular character sheet still only has 100 for the HP, so it'll have a max HP of 125, but a current HP of 100. So make sure you set both the max and the value for the HP. And for now, we can just get rid of this section with the embed and items, and we'll save our macro, and then we will test to make sure that our changes went through.
to test, we'll just open up our actor and click the spell again. And we're going to try both the level 8 and level 9 versions of the spell. When we bring them in, both play beautifully with their animations. The left demon has only 100 HP, while the right demon has 125, as we expect for casting it at a ninth level. Next, I'm not sure what the data is for armor class. So to find that, I'm going to hit F12 and open up my console. Then I'm going to type underscore token while I have the demon selected. Underscore token gives you either the currently selected token or the last selected token. Then I'm going to go into data, actor data, data attributes, and I can see that the HP has been set in there, but I don't see AC here. That means it's pulling from the embedded actor data within the actor's directory. I'm going to go into the document that the token is created from. And within actor, I can then find the data that's in the fainter purple. And that's going to be the embedded data that we pull from. And here in attributes, we can see AC and HP. In HP, we can see all of the things from our sheet. And if we go up to the AC, we can see a variety of options, including flat, calc, formula, etc. In this case, I know that I need the flat value. If you weren't sure which value you needed for this to actually reflect on the sheet, you could set all of these and then comment out each line until you found the one that actually was responsible for the change. But again, I know that it's going to be AC flat. So I'm going to use the same data structure that is used with HP max and HP value. So I can just copy that HP line and tweak it to work for armor class. So if I paste it down, I just change instead of hp.value to ac.flat. Next, I'm instead of having it being spell level times something, it's going to be just the spell level plus 13. So I'm making sure that I get rid of my parentheses. And that's actually a relatively simple change to make here. It's a lot easier than one might think to set up the AC. And then if I go ahead and close my console, so I don't run into the debugger as I do this, and go ahead and resummon the other demon, I will notice that instead of having a 13 AC, it's going to have a much higher AC. And we can see it's at 21. 13 plus 8 is 21. If we click on the actor again and now summon a ninth level version, we should now see an AC of 22. Perfect. Now that we have the base stats figured out, it's time to go ahead and start working on the features. I'm first going to work on multi attack, and I need to know the data structure for this. So we're going back to our console and using the underscore token to go in and find the data for our token. Once again, we got to go into the document, the actor, and then the actor's data. Within the data, you'll find an items section where there are multiple items. The main thing that we want to find here is the multi attack one. You can see that there are different labels and names. And here, if we go into the value, we can see under the data that there's a name of multi attack. Within this, I can find all kinds of different bits. Here, the description is what actually matters, as there's no other information for a multi-attack feature. So I'm just going to copy and paste this, because we're editing just the description for this. You can, in theory, update the description for all of these as they scale, so that they reflect the true values, but that's a lot of extra work. Returning to our macro, now we're going to go ahead and add embed, or embedded, rather. And this is going to be for all of these things buried deeper in the sheet, like items. If you've used Warpgate at all, you'll notice that these macros are fairly familiar to Warpgate, as they're essentially just a skinned up version of the Warpgate macros and have a few things streamlined for them. So we're doing embedded and item. It's important that item is capitalized, otherwise the macro won't fire properly. Now that I have my item set up, I'm going to go ahead and add the exact name of this feature, which is multi-attack. 
I put my multi attack in quotation marks and have a colon after it to set the value. With the curly brackets, I'll actually set all of the data that I'm defining. And I like to have those closed already. I'm able to reference the data that's over in my console to see the exact structure. We data dot description dot value. And again, that's in quotation marks with a colon to set the value. And I'm going to paste in the previous value for the description. That way I can kind of tweak it. You'll notice that there are HTML tags for paragraph and strong. And I'm going to replace the quotations here with backticks so that I have a whole string that I can put variables and such in without having to add the strings together. And I'm going to use a dollar sign and curly brackets to use another string that's going to call variables and do some math in it. The backtick basically sets this whole group as a string that is going to go into the description field, while the dollar sign and curly brackets is a substring, if you will, for defining some things out. So within that curly brackets, I'm going to create the args 0.spell level divided by 2. So that's the feature coming from automated evocations. I'm going to put that in parentheses and use JavaScript's math.floor command to make sure that it's going to round down. And we can save the macro and try it out here in just a second. I'm going back through and making sure that all of my strings are properly closed. And I decide that I want to make this strong so it'll appear bold. That way it's easy to see once we've summed the daemon how many attacks it gets per turn. Again, we wouldn't really worry about changing the description on an attack, but since it's multi-attack and the only thing represented in the HUD is the description, it's very useful here. So if I go into features with this newly summoned elder daemon, notice that it says it makes four attacks equal to half this spell's level routed down. I have decided that I should probably fix the half this spell's level routed down bit. So that's as simple as just going back and fixing my companion macro. And all I have to do is just remove this attacks equal to half the spell's level rounded down part. It can just say attacks in one round. And that'll work for the future elder demons that we summon. And as we can see, this reads nice and clearly, and it says four attacks, as we would expect with a level eight spell divided by two and rounded down. Now that we've set up our HP and AC and the description for multi-attack, let's go ahead and configure the damage for the claw attack. For this one, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the arcane hand macro again and use that as a template. I'm going to take the clenched fist section and copy and paste that directly into my companion. From there, I need to change the clenched fist item name to match exactly the claw attack item. The naming convention is how automated evocations and warp gate know what items to adjust. Now, the next thing we're going to do is actually update the claw attack to use our spell attack ability modifier. Thankfully, the arcane hand already does this for us. We're calling from the assigned actor, so the summoning actor, their spell save DC and subtracting eight from it. In 5e, your spell save DC is your proficiency bonus plus your spell ability modifier, and the proficiency bonus plus the spell casting ability modifier is exactly what we would use to make a melee spell attack, plus any potential melee spell attack bonuses we have from items or features. So here we're deriving that melee spell attack to hit from the spell save DC and applying any global bonuses for it. I've gone ahead and pulled up our Elder Demon character sheet so that we can look at it as we set up the actual damage calculation. This particular attack, we're going to use 1d8 plus 4 plus twice the spell's level in magical slashing damage. So I'm going to clean up the data.damage.parts from the arcane hand by clearing out everything except for this d8 and some of the spell level bits. So I can rewrite this by adding the 1d8 at the very beginning 
adding four to it, and then using the args bracket zero dot spell level and multiplying that by two within another set of parentheses. You'll again notice that we're making use of the dollar sign in the curly brackets so that we can use this whole string together. And then that's everything we need to do for the calculation part. I've also added an or operator so that if we don't have a spell level, it will default to eight, which is what we assume to be our minimum. Then instead of having force damage for our context, we're making it slashing. For that, I wanna review things and notice that I need to put in commas here. It's really important to make sure you have the appropriate commas, otherwise your macros won't work properly. Just go slow and double check your work. Otherwise you'll have a lot of frustration as you have just simple typos. When we summon in our daemon, we can then double click on him and check his features. Multi-tag still works. Qualtech has the appropriate description. Since we're not adding the description, we need to check the details and we'll notice it says 1d8 plus four plus 16 and has an attack roll bonus of 11. Should match five plus our proficiency bonus of six. So it looks like that's all set. Now we just need to go ahead and add in our other features. To make this easier on myself, I'm just going to copy and paste in claw attack uh, a couple of times and then update that for the other abilities like fire whip and death throws. When I have the abilities renamed, I update the damage formulas to make sure they match the descriptions and have the proper damage type for the context, like fire for the fire whip. With the damage dealt with, it's time to add in the spell save. And this one is just simply data.save.dc. And all we're doing is calling the spell save DC of the assigned actor. I do want to add an or operator in case we don't have an assigned actor, and we'll just set it to something like 12 or 14. Note that there is a question mark in assigned actor. That's showing that if assigned actor isn't defined, it will automatically default over to the other side of the or operator. I'm going to use the exact same formula for updating the save on death rows. So I'm going to put that in instead of a to hit on death rows, since it's just an AOE save. For death rows, it actually is going to calculate a number of dice as opposed to a total number value. So I'm just adjusting this so that it is going to be doing the spell level times d8 for fire damage. When I'm done, I save the macro, and then I will summon a new version of the Elder Demon and see if everything took hold properly. I have no error codes, so that's looking good. Double checking, and our claw attack still has the prop upper attack roll bonus and damage formula, and Fire Whip has everything we're looking for and the appropriate saving throw. And Death Throws looks all good as well. Now that I've set up our first Elder Demon, let's add in a few variants. Like the many Tasha's Cauldron of Everything spells, we're gonna have a few different types of demon that can be brought in. I'm going to augment the description for the spell a bit to reflect this. And I'm also going to add in some of the extra instructions that are normally on there, such as the demon sharing the same initiative count as the summoner, but taking its turn immediately after. And I'm going to decide on a few variants. Here, I think I want to go with a frost variant, something that flies and is like dark, and something looking poisony. Mostly basing this off of tokens that I found from Forgotten Ventures that I like, but it doesn't really matter here.
When I've updated the spell, since there are going to be variants of the Elder Demon, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate the actor and make a total of four of them. That way I can have one for each, and I have a lot of the groundwork already laid. They are going to share some features, like all of them will have the claw attack, and all of them will have death throws, etc., and a similar HP pool, so I don't need to reinvent the wheel every time I make one. And I'm just going to append their attribute or element to the end of each name. So I'll now have the Elder Demon of Fire, or the one we've already finished, and then create Plague, Darkness, and Ice. I've put them all in the same folder to make things easier on myself and keep things organized. And I'll go ahead and change their appearances. Notice that my file picker looks a bit different from the base file picker. That is from Ripper's File Picker Plus module, and it's really handy for previewing things like this. And that's what's giving me these nice thumbnails up in the top left that are larger size. Because I've configured my prototype token a bit, I do need to go in and manually change all of my images, but that's not a big deal. When I have everything configured to my liking, I need to go back and update my companion macro now. This is no longer for general elder demons, this is specifically for the fire one. So I'm just going to copy in the new name and replace that in my companion macro. Everything else will stay the same. I also need to update the summon elder demon entry in my custom auto spells. So I'm changing it from just elder demon to elder demon dash fire. And I need to add new entries for my other Elder Demon types. So I'm just going to add in the other three here. Since I have three different types of uh, demons to add here, I'm also going to go ahead and specify custom animations for them. So the Demon of Darkness will have the Darkness animation, the Ice Demon will get the Ice 1 animation, and I've decided that actually I don't like any of the animations that are available for the Plague Demon. So I'm going to make my own custom animation here in a little bit to use for that one. I've gone through the list to see if there's anything I was okay with, but again I've ultimately settled on making a custom animation. For now, though, I'm going to comment out the custom animation as a placeholder. I now also need to remove my existing entry in the custom auto spell section of my game settings. Otherwise, it's not going to have all of the new information. So I'm just making a copy of that remove test weapon macro and just replacing test weapon with summon elder demon in there just to get rid of it. With my macro ready to go, I open up my console with F12 and view my game settings for custom auto summons. Summon Elder Demon is there. If I run the removal macro and rerun that view game settings macro, it disappears. And after re adding it, again, it will automatically refresh. And I can run my macro to view the game settings one more time and see that it's been re added. But now, instead of an array of one, it has an array of four, and I've got all four of my Elder Demons present. And if we go into the spell book for our test actor, and we go to summon the Elder Demon, there's now, instead of one option, there's a total of four, and they already have animations preset. And they're dropping in no problem. And the Fire Elder Demon is still functioning with all of its nice auto scaling. But if we summon in any of the other demons, like the ice one here, it does not have any of the auto scaling already applied.
I've gone ahead and diversified the different character sheets here, and this is how I would handle things like in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, how some of the summons have different health totals, like the Plague Demon here, and they have different speeds and different abilities. So for example, the Plague Demon has a ability called Toxic Deluge that's going to force a save for half damage, or if not, they're going to take damage and then have a save for poison. So as you can see, all of them have one unique attack and some other tweaks to their abilities. For example, they have different speeds, like the Fire Demon has a burrow speed, but nothing else does. The Plague Demon is a lot slower than the others, but has much higher HP. And the Darkness Demon is significantly faster with its flight and has the flyby feature, but in exchange has a lower HP total. To now set up all of my custom scaling, I'm going to basically make copies of my Elder Demon macro for fire. And I'm just going to tweak the attacks that I need. And that will be how we set up the other demons. I'm just copy and pasting things over and making sure my macros are scripts. And we'll set this one up for the darkness demon. Previously, I chose icons from my 5e systems folder, and I just want to keep it consistent with these similar kind of runic circles going on just to keep things organized and know what spells and macros are associated. This is completely optional. It's just useful for me for organizational purposes. Just like we did with the Elder Demon of Fire, I'm pulling up the Elder Demon of Darkness's sheet up so that I have a good reference point, and I'm adjusting my hit point total because it still scales at the same rate, but the base line is 80 instead of 100. Then instead of Fire Whip, it has the Ray of Darkness, so I'm going to adjust my damage on that one. From here you can see that once you have a base template to work with, this is actually pretty straightforward as far as creating multiple different creatures using similar stat types. And now when we summon in this Elder Demon, it has the 80 hit points and 21 C, and the Ray of Darkness here has the appropriate to hit bonus and the appropriate save. Uh, it looks like I did not specify that it was a wisdom save, so I just need to update that on the original actor sheet, but there's nothing else to do on the macro. I've gone ahead and repeated the process for the darkness, ice, and toxin, or plague demons. So they're all configured to have the appropriate stats and appropriate scaling. And I just use the same process that I demonstrated for the darkness demon, where I copied over that fire demon macro and tweaked the individual attacks. And now we're going to go into just demonstrating that they all work properly. So we have our original fire, the darkness one that we did together. our Ice Demon, and finally our Plague Demon, which still does not have his own animation. When we click into any of these, they have the appropriate ACs and hit points. And if we were to use any of their features or check in on those, they would still have the correct scaling. Now that all of our scaling is correct and we have all of our demons able to be summoned, let's go ahead and add a custom animation. I've created this macro here that is the Poison 1 animation. I'm not getting very creative with this. I'm yoinking this straight from the Automated Evocations GitHub, where Ripper's put together an example. 
And you'll notice that the layout here is very similar to the add spell one. I've changed the function from add spell to add anim just to keep things straight for myself. And I'm swapping out the custom auto spells for custom animations. And one really important thing to note is that while cannon shot or a spell is an array, as signified by this closed bracket, the poison one of animation is not an array. It is just an item. So there's no square brackets. Here, the function is poison one. That is going to be a macro that we actually use to describe the sequence used by sequencer to play the animations. The other animations are functions actually specified within the automated evocations JavaScript. Time is in milliseconds, how long to wait after the animation is complete before actually bringing up the creature. Sorry, not complete after the animation begins. The name is how it will appear when you go through the animation selection in the companion manager. And the group is the same tags as like elemental or magical as we saw with the other animations. This one is optional, but it's useful for keeping your thing separate from the stock items. I still have the await for setting up the game settings in the function and call the function separately. That way I can make sure everything gets updated and then it will do a refresh so I don't have to refresh again and make sure everything is all good to go. So after I execute that, you'll notice that if I go to open my campaign manager, it will have the poison option. But if I go to summon something, nothing actually happens. This is because we don't have the poison one function, or in this case, it is a macro, uh, actually in our game. We don't have to do anything special with this macro in terms of putting it into a special place. We just have to make it. So I've created the poison one macro. And again, I'm not gonna get creative. I'm using the exact same example from Ripper's uh, example on the GitHub. And this one is actually for an energy spark setup, but this is a good template to start from. There's absolutely nothing wrong with using a template and then branching out from there. So after I've saved that macro, I just want to check to make sure that, that works properly. You don't actually have to refresh for this phase. You'll notice now that when I summon this constrictor snake with a poison animation, it will play that energy spark pattern that was in Ripper's example. So what's actually going on in this macro? If you've worked with sequencer at all, this will look very familiar. This is exactly a sequencer macro. So you can do anything with this that you can do with sequencer. There's a lot of different moving parts here and going into the nuts and bolts of sequencer is really worthy of its own video. But a few quick things to note here, the const template and const token data, uh, the args that are being passed there are being passed by automated evocations. The first argument that we end up using for our template is basically the X and Y coordinate of where the creature is going to be summoned. And the second argument is basically what that token is. You can think of it similarly to if we had sequence, parentheses, something, comma, something else, that first one is arg zero and the second one is arg one. But those are being passed by uh, automated evocations. It might be more simple to think of it as being passed to poison one function here. So again, that first one is our X and Y and the second one is the actual token data itself. I don't notice it here, but later I catch that I did not delete the S in sequence there and I have to go fix that later. But with sequencer, we create a new sequence that is going to do a variety of effects. And we start with the first effect. And the main thing here that we're gonna work with is the file that it's calling. This is calling a file already included in the automated evocations module. So if you wanna use the same one, we absolutely can. We can swap them around. Then we're setting it below tokens so it doesn't obscure the tokens, randomly rotating it, randomly offsetting it, and making sure that it's at the location of the template, and then scaling the data of the animation to be appropriate to the specific token that we're using. This wait function here is how long between the first effect before the second effect starts firing. So the first half a second, that first effect is all that's firing. Then after half a second, the second effect will play.
So when we want to customize this, we want to go in and decide a new uh, animation here. I've gone into the Bailiwick Maps Premium Towns module, and under Maps, Town Square, MISC2, there's the animated Gorgon assets. He has some great boiling poison animations that I want to use. So I've dropped that in as a tile and copied the file path just to make sure I don't make any mistakes. I'm going to copy that in and save the macro. Now when I summon the Constrictor Snake, we see this bubbling poison come up, and we still have that yellow ring that pops out at the end. That's the second animation. And I think those blobs are a little small, so I increase the scaling from 0.15 to 0.25. And now I'm going to go back and I think I like the more amorphous and blobby looking po boiling poison for the first part of the animation. And I'll end with that more rounded poison animation. So I'm just going to replace the first file with the boiling poison one from Gorgon and then use that boiling poison two for the second animation. I think that'll be a nicer bookend to have bubbling amorphous poison finished by a much more round, full cloud. Yeah, I like that a lot, and I think that really works for how little time we had to spend on this. One of the really nice things about making the custom animations is that you can really tweak them a lot within the sequencer, and because you don't have to refresh between every step or do any re-importing, you can experiment a lot and make sure you're getting what you want. So I definitely recommend that you play around with this and check out the sequencer module itself for more possibilities. Now that we've created the new animation, let's add it to our summon elder demon spell and set as the proper animation for a plague demon. So I'm going to decomment the animation that set fire and change it to poison one, which is what we specified in the add animation macro that we called earlier and add it to our custom animation settings of our game settings. Once again, I've got to remove the Summon Elder Demon spell so that we can re-add it with the new data. And we add it back, refreshing. Then if we go into our spell book and go to Summon the Elder Demon, we get the nice pop-up and we'll notice that the Plague Demon has Poison pre-selected and we can drop it in. So there we go, we've created a custom animation and added it to one of our custom scaling creatures. Another great feature we can do with the companion macros is we can do anything that a normal macro could. When we bring in this creature, if it got summoned by the companion manager, we can call this macro. So I want this T-Rex to roar whenever we bring it in. So I'm gonna copy the same AE companion macro. That way this same macro will fire every single time the Tyrannosaurus Rex is summoned with the companion manager. And here I'm just gonna use the audio helper to actually play the sound. So it's audio helper dot play, and then we're just gonna submit some arguments here with the source, and I'll put in this file name in just a moment, but I wanna get the rest of it down. Then I'm just gonna set the volume, any value between zero and one. I think 0.5 is pretty reasonable for most sound effects. And then I'll make sure the autoplay is true. And I don't want this to loop, otherwise this is going to be very obnoxious very quickly. And then finally, another true to make sure that it will actually play and close with a semicolon. After I close up my macro, I'm going to go into my sounds and I'm going to grab a sound that I recently downloaded from a royalty-free sound place. There's this dinosaur sound. I'm going to select it, and then I'm going to be able to just copy the file path. And the great feature you'll notice about File Picker Plus is that I can preview sounds without actually having to place them somewhere, which is really convenient. And I'm going to go back to my macro, and I'm going to replace that file here I put as a temporary placeholder and paste in my actual dinosaur roar and save the macro. With the macro all saved, I will go back into my companion manager and I will add in the 
Tyrannosaurus Rex, and summon it. You can also summon it via a spell, but I'm not going to bother setting up a summon T-Rex spell. And you've got the same great sound. This will work with any of the animations as well. All right, and there you have it. So in addition to being able to use sound, you can use a variety of effects. Anything that you can do with a macro, you can also call with the AE companion macro. So you can get very creative with this. All right, everyone, this has been Zephyr. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this really helped answer some questions that people still had about automated evocations and how to use it for things like the Tosh's Cauldron of Everything spells and some really creative uses that you can bring into your games, like creating your own custom summoning spells and creating those custom animations. I'm really looking forward to what people do with the Automated Evocations module and especially on the custom animation side. There's a lot of great potential leveraging Sequencer, and you can get some really interesting effects there. So thanks again for watching. Please let me know if you have any other questions, and let me know what else you'd like me to cover. Thanks again, and have a good one.